All right. Uh, I'm Jonas and Tatsenberg. I'm based in Uppsala at the actually same university as uh, Magali, but in another location. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in ecology, so with with uh, with the ecological background basically. But I've been interested in this over the past three four years, computer vision and stuff. So so I'll present some work on seabirds that I'm currently doing. And just to start off a little bit with the broader topics that I'm interested in. So why would AI be interested in ecological field studies? So, so, and I think one obvious thing that we touched upon multiple times already is this opportunity to process large amounts of data. And that could be for various reasons. It could be just to increase uh, resolution to find rare events. It could mm -hmm. be finding anomalies for further inspection, etc. There are many reasons to do this. It's, we, we're saving money, etc. at least in the long term. Uh, but I think it's getting even more interesting. We can start describing possibly complex and maybe even unknown patterns that we don't obviously see. It's not about our teaching the computer to do something. Maybe the computer can start teaching us doing things. And, and, and as a third part, we can do things quickly, uh, hopefully in real time, to understand and, and forecast e ecosystems and use that potentially for decision support for, for envir environmental management, for example. And I'm working on, in the Baltic, Baltic Sea on an island called Stora Karlsö, uh, and I work with common guillemots. You see them uh, behind this window over there. And over the past 15 years or so, I've been building up this facility called uh, the Karlsö Oak Lab, which is an artificial construction in the middle of the seabird colony where the birds actually, by their own, have mo moved in <laughs> on artificial ledges. And that, that's a facility that makes it uh, very easy to integrate various types of sensors to study these birds in the real environment in a very controlled settings. So all these things you can see here are cameras, for example. So we have around 40, oh yeah, I, I can't point to this one. You point to this one. Yeah, you see the cameras there. There are some weighing scales there. There are some temperature sensors and other type of sensors in the system. And then behind the wall, uh, me and my colleagues are actually hiding <laughs> in here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can watch the birds from very close distance, which we did at start there. But now increasingly, we use sensors uh, to, to, to study these birds automatically instead. And then... Um, yeah, so that, that, that's the setup of everything. I can talk about this forever, but uh, I, I won't do that now. And one of the first things we, we did was to train models to identify uh, adult birds, in this case, and chicks, just to automate kind of the typical things we're doing when we're out there in the fields, counting birds and, and counting chicks. So this is a, it's a YOLO V5. It's a YOLO, it's a very famous object detection model we trained on, on these birds specifically. As you can see, this model is not perfect. There are some occlusion, uh, it's occluded bird over the, uh, there in the background that there are some missing detections sometimes when the ship is doing weird things, it's missing some detections sometimes. And this is actually deliberate uh, <laughs> that I put this on here because this is a kind of medium sized models with quite strongly scaled down pictures. Uh, and there's always this trade off between model accuracy and speed, right? And we want to do things in real time and to run things on multiple cameras in the field. And then you have to find this balance between a very, very good model that sees everything perfectly and something that can run in real time in an efficient way. So there are some scores over there. And then next question, what can we use these detections for? So, so this is streaming, it's 40 cameras streaming at 30 frames per second over months uh, from the birds arrived to the colony to till they leave about two and a half months later. One example, I'll, I'll just provide a few uh, snapshots here. One example is this, if you just look at the size of these bounding boxes for each ship, you actually see day by day how they're growing. So this is a, this is a way that we didn't think of before we started this, that we could actually monitor growth of these ships just by object detection. And we validated this with, with actual actually weighing a few chicks. Obviously, we cannot weigh them minute by minute uh, as it's done. Or maybe we can. I can tell you that later. But, uh, but it, it works. 
uh, it seems that it's working. So it's a kind of known intrusive model where actually AI can teach us something that, that we didn't necessarily know. And, and possibly you could see changes between seasons, changes between chicks and so on that, that is actually detectable through this method. <laughs> Another example, just by looking at adult attendance uh, on the clip. So this is footage from a very, very hot day on a thermal camera over there and a normal camera there. It's around 46 degrees Celsius in the sun in this day and no wind, you can see. And, and by looking at the attendance of uh, at different temperature intervals over a whole season, you could see that when it's getting above 35 degrees, they're actually starting to leave their chicks and the eggs uh, and, and because they cannot handle it anymore. And for those ones who are very attentive, you may have seen that it just dropped its egg over there because of, uh, of heat stress. This so it's another way to combine object detection in this case with continuous temperature measurements to, to understand physiological limits for for birds in the wild. Next step in this, I mean, th this is where we have kind of questions, ecological questions already. We think that we may look at, we may see some growth if we look at sizes, or we may see an effect of high temperatures and so on. But what if we just take the object detection outputs, continuous outputs, and see how they look like? And could we, in a more kind of unsupervised way, start to find patterns in this data that can tell us something about these birds. So this is an example of this. This is, we, from these raw metrics, we can get movement, we can get bounding box sizes, we can dis get distance between individuals, all kinds of stuff from these boxes. And then we've done here a principal component analysis, which is, and, and we're showing here the PC1 of bird behavior, uh, so to say, on the ledge. You can see the top one is over two, months, the whole breeding season, it's happening something towards the end there, either the activity is going up a lot, which I think is happening, or, or, or down. This is the same time series for six days, you see some very clear diurnal pattern between day and night in this case, and this is just over two hours, where you can start see, seeing actually maybe detailed behavioral patterns in this data. So in this case, I checked last, last night, there's actually two chicks that are jumping from the ledge because they're, they're, they're leaving the cliff to go down to the beach. Uh, on this peak here, the, this is the uh, arrival of a bird, uh, a non-resident bird to the cliff, starting to run around, etc. So perhaps we could automatically start to, to, to get quite detailed information just by this AI-generated data, so to say. Um, We've been touching upon this uh, subject already a little bit with the need for annotations and, and how, much, uh, how much that requires in form of labor, especially in, in the start of the project. One thing we've been working with to, to speed this up a little bit is what, what Sara talked about, about closed feedback loops. So you, you start training a model with just a few annotations, you run it to generate some new data, you, and then we develop this GUI to read in these new annotations and just verify in a much quicker way than you would start from scratch. And then you retrain, retrain the model and then you do it iteratively for, for many times. And then you can quite quickly um, get a, a good model even from a, a start of quite little annotations. You don't need to spend half a year just annotating boring things. You can pick out in a smart way interesting frames to annotate. And you can do that either to Comparing different models, so in one, in one uh, use case we compared YOLO with Detectron 2, which is this segmentation model from ESA, and, and look at the difference between those ones. You could also simply just take out those with medium high confidence scores, for example, and just look at them specifically. And then you can quite quickly get to a large annotation data set. And this, as you see, this is not birds anymore, this is the fish that the birds are flying in with. So this is the current Oh, where it's coming. It's supposed to be another, um, oh, here. So this is the final, it's not the final model, obviously, but it's the current model based on these uh, two ways of iterative process. You see some false negatives blinking there sometimes, but there's a fish coming in there with quite high confidence, based on actually a very low annotation data set to start with. Uh, this GUI is in, in uh, GitHub, you can check it out. 
if you look at the top of this frame, there is a small platform, and, and to the left, there is a camera sitting. And the next, uh, in the next slide, you will see some video footage from, from that little platform, which is not the normal platform, but a uh, weighing scale, actually. This bird here walks out on a weighing scale. Weight is coming up there. And here's another YOLO model, actually, finding the ring, mm -hmm. with the extra trick. Uh, in this case, it's Google Cloud Vision algorithm that actually reads this text. Uh, and so, so we get which individual have this particular weight in this system. And, and here's another example of how you can use annotation in a smart way. So, Google Cloud Vision is a quite expensive service, and you can only read it in the cloud. But what we did was we spent some money on sending up a lot of images, and then we were using those images we're getting back from Google to train our own model, to use the Google inference as annotations, uh, so to say, to speed up that process a little bit. And, and this is the weight trend of uh, all birds over the whole season. You can see the decline, which is due to the cost of overproduction, basically. So it costs the birds to be in the colony over time. It costs to feed the chicks. So, so you see this decline. It's getting more interesting, of course, if you look individual by individual. The other reason for why we're doing this is that this is also a way to create, to cheaply create a lot of annotations on known individuals. So here, you get, we get 30 images per second on this particular individual, also filmed from above and from the side. And then we can use that to train a classifier to distinguish between the individuals, because that's a little bit of a silver bullet, in, at least in the world of common guillemot research, because they look very similar, all of them. But I'm sure uh, deep learning at some point can actually distinguish the individuals in this case. Uh, I started talking a little bit about that we want to do things in the edge. So far, we've been mainly training on high-performance computers on stored data, so after the field season, basically. But we started experimenting with different edge devices. I'm working a lot with an organization called AI Sweden, and in Gothenburg, they have a so-called edge lab, where they, have, they can put up, a, it's a very nice test bed, a test environment for a lot of different edge devices, such as Google Corals and Raspberry Pis and all kinds of more advanced stuff. And you can access it from, from anywhere through, if you have a uh, partnership with them, and you can try out things that will work in the field, hopefully, later on. So, so what I would, just to start summing up, I think AI has multiple roles in ecosystem monitoring. I've been primarily working in this arena where we start putting up sensors and try to make, uh, make sense of sensor data. We use a lot of supervised machine learning, possibly a lot edge computing, and so on. But then, as we moving toward, when we're getting more and more of these automated data sets, we can start putting them together to look at anomalies, <coughs> to maybe start informing ecosystem models with this continuous data, and in the end, maybe even use it for decision support uh, outside the, the academic sphere. So, some ideas on what I think are some interesting frontiers in this. I think, I mean, in a sense, every project, especially in ecology, starts very much from scratch uh, with training models and so on. I mean, your example is very nice that there is already a framework that you can start using, but many have started kind of from very basic level. It would be nice to start developing these little bit more general pipelines uh, for ecologists. And, and I've been working primarily now with object detection, which is a very suitable case, I think, which every object detection project you do is very similar, and it's getting faster and faster. And if we can do this even more kind of streamlined, it will help a lot, I think. Then I think building good systems for field sites in terms of both sensor, computation, storage, communication is a very interesting topic. And then, of course, developing higher level ecosystem indicators based on these continuous sensor data. And then I think unsupervised learning is, is interesting area to go into as well. So with that said, I think I'm definitely not, I mean, <laughs> I, I won't talk more, basically. So, but, <laughs> but, you can, 
reach out to me. I'm leaving Wednesday afternoon, unfortunately. But uh, thank you very much for listening. And happy to discuss.